fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we conclude our video series on the authority of Scripture with an examination of the canonization of the Bible. So come and watch me butcher the names of church fathers as we take a tour through early Christianity. <laughs> In your Bible, you might come to a section bracketed off from the rest of the text which might say something like this, the most reliable early manuscripts and other witnesses do not have. That is a warning sign. Proceed with caution. So for instance, at the end of Mark chapter 16 verses 9 through 20 seem to be later additions. The early manuscripts do not have those verses. It's absent from two of the oldest Greek manuscripts. It's absent from a Syriac manuscript. It's absent from about a hundred Armenian manuscripts, and it's absent from two of the oldest Georgian manuscripts. What's more, we have the writings of the early church fathers. Remember how we mentioned that they quoted the New Testament? Well, Clement of Alexandria and Oregon are totally unaware of those verses. Eusebius and Jerome said those verses were absent from all of the Greek manuscripts that they were aware of, and in some of the manuscripts that do have Mark chapter 16, 9 through 20, it is marked with an asterisk, which is what copyists did to indicate a spurious addition to a document. Plus, we have more than one ending to Mark. There's the longer and the shorter. Here's the shorter. But they reported briefly to those with Peter all that had been commanded them, and afterward Jesus himself sent out through them from the east even to the west the sacred and incorruptible message of eternal salvation. So for all of these reasons, this passage is in doubt. So should we consider it scripture? Well, these folks certainly take verse 18 as scripture. I don't see the harm, unless you want to lose a digit or two. But wait, there's more. How about that most famous passage of Jesus and the adulterous woman? Yep, that goes under the bracketed Bible. The earliest manuscripts don't have it, and the early church fathers don't mention it. They don't quote from it in their Bible commentaries. They skip from John chapter 7, verse 44 to John chapter 8, verse 12. Almost as if it wasn't there. That's most likely because it wasn't. The earliest manuscript with its inclusion is about from 400 AD. The placement of it varies. It doesn't always appear there in John. Some manuscripts it comes later. In some manuscripts it comes earlier. In some manuscripts it pops up in Luke for some reason. The writing style and the flow of the narrative does not match, according to the scholars, with John's writing. So, what do we make of this passage? Well, most likely this was a story that probably had some historical basis and probably well-spread story and the scribe probably really liked it and then included it. Okay, but how should we treat it? Is it the inerrant word of God? Well, I would say no. It's not written by John. It's not written by an eyewitness. Now, that doesn't mean you need to rip it out of your Bible, but anytime you approach the bracketed off section of your Bible, that is a warning sign. Proceed with caution. We have strong evidence that it is not part of the original manuscript, and our definition for inerrancy pertains only to the original manuscript. Point. Counterpoint. I really like that passage, so it's totally scripture. It's my life verse. I would advise against that. Well, God is omnipotent, and he transmitted the Bible exactly as he wanted it. I totally agree, but one of the probable reasons why God transmitted his message through thousands of copies is so that we could spot errors and eliminate them. If there was just one document, then it could be changed or altered, and we'd have no idea what the original actually said. So in essence, God chose in his power to reveal his word to us in this manner, so that we could spot the errors and know for certain what the original said. You're an error. Okay. Your face is an error. We have the same face. Don't take my story. I really like that one. Okay, as seemingly worthless as that segment was, it does lead us to another question when talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. Namely, what is Scripture? As Christians, how do we know that these particular 27 books of the New Testament are the inerrant Word of God? To answer that, we have to look at how our New Testament was canonized. Nope, too many ends. There you go. 
Uh, there are lots of other writings out there, some manuscripts even claiming to be important gospels like the Gnostic Gospels as popularized by Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which was a work that exposed the average citizen to Gnostic conspiracies and terrible haircuts. But setting aside fiction, the fact is, these writings were never really accepted by the church. The early church fathers wrote about them, spoke out against them, and called them heresies. We don't find any codexes with our New Testament writings and the Gnostics placed together. So these were books that were not ever seriously in contention to be canonized or considered to have authority or to be divinely inspired. They were just as nonsensical as the Da Vinci Code itself. But this kind of movement, these kind of heresies, did prompt and compel the church fathers to start a process of canonization. And so they began to argue and debate what is and what is not canon. There are other writings that are not Gnostic, and some of them are written by notable people. For instance, Clement of Rome. Clement was a first century convert, and it's believed that he wrote 1 Clement, which was a letter to the Corinth church. He was taught by Paul or Peter, and many believe this Clement is referred to in Philippians 4 verse 3. Some of these writings had acceptance among the early church fathers, and you do find some of these documents and codexes with our New Testament writings. So then. How do we get our Bible? The Roman Catholics would point to the Council of Hippo, which was the first time a council of bishops listed and approved a Christian biblical canon that corresponds to the modern Roman Catholic canon. The canon was later approved at the Council of Carthage. Now, this is important because they believe it demonstrates the necessity of the authority of the church and by extension, the Pope, because sola scriptura, fine, but who decides what is scriptura? But it's not really accurate to say that this was the decision point. This was the stamp of approval of a growing consensus over time. So for instance, we have the Muratorian Canon from the end of the second century. This document gives a list of the canonical books with some comments. It states what documents are to be regarded as canonical and which are to be rejected. It lists all of the books of our New Testament except Hebrews, James, and 2 Peter, but it's also a fragment, so maybe the full manuscript had those. Then you have Athanasius' Festal Letter. Athanasius lists the exact 27 New Testament text that we have as canon, and he wrote the list to end disputes about such texts as the Shepherd or the Epistle of Barnabas, which long had been regarded as equal to the apostolic letters. So what you see in history is a broad acceptance of certain books and some works that were debated, but kind of criteria starts to take shape. Number one, does it conform to Christian doctrine? Now that might seem weird. How do we know what Christian doctrine is apart from the Bible? But there was an understanding of Christian theology. It was taught to them by the apostles and practiced in the churches for centuries before any formal canonization. And although the church struggled with understanding some aspects of Christianity, particularly the Trinity, they certainly had a basis for Christian thought. They had creedal statements. So a question for canonization is, does it conform to Christian doctrine? Well, the Gnostic Gospels are right out then. They don't, they don't correspond. The second thing that we are looking for is this. Is it written by an apostle or at least strongly influenced by an apostle? So this makes sense, right? If I'm telling you something and Peter is over here telling you something, we both have the Holy Spirit, but Peter would have more authority. He was there. He experienced these things firsthand. He has a unique connection to Jesus. And that's how we define apostles. So related to this is, is the manuscript early. If it's not early, it's probably not from an apostle. All of our New Testament is arguably from the first century, and certainly we have nothing past 120 AD. And these are good ways of looking at our scriptures. These are the books of our New Testament. So are they early? Yeah, they're early. Do they conform to the doctrine of Christianity? Yeah, I would certainly hope so. Uh, is their authorship apostolic? Do they have special connections to Jesus? Were they there? Well, let's break it down. Matthew, he was one of the 12. Mark, this is John Mark. And John Mark might have been an early disciple of Jesus while he was on earth, but the early church fathers are unanimous that John Mark was a companion of Peter. We see that in scripture. And that Mark wrote the recollections of Peter. Luke. Luke is different, so let's get back to Luke and Acts. 
John, John, one of the 12 in the inner circle. John wrote John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Then we have the writings of Paul. And although Paul wasn't a follower of Jesus early, he does have a unique experience with the risen Lord. He calls himself an apostle, and his apostleship is confirmed by the other apostles. Next, you have Hebrews. Honestly, we don't know who wrote this. The early church thought Paul did, which is probably why they included it. James was the brother of Jesus. Not an original follower, but it seems he came to saving faith when he saw the resurrected Jesus, as Paul explained in 1 Corinthians. James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem and as such is an apostle. Then we have Peter. Duh. Jude. Jude is the brother of James and Jesus. Probably came to saving faith in the same way as James. So another eyewitness to what happened, an intimate knowledge about the person of Jesus. So Luke. Luke is forming his gospel using Mark as a template. He's also a historian, so he's speaking with the eyewitnesses. And in Acts, he is personally there for much of it. And he is recounting clearly what Paul and other apostles are telling him. And Luke and Acts were widely accepted very early on. It seemed universally accepted as being authentic and having authority. Hebrews. If Paul wrote it, we're golden. Now contrast that with the other writings. The Epistle of Barnabas. It's rejected because of its late date. It's between 90 to 130 AD. Strongly argues it could not have been written by Barnabas because he would have been long since dead. The Shepherd was a respected book. It was widely circulated. It was quoted by the early church fathers, but they did seem to regard it as different. The Muratorian fragment that we mentioned earlier talks about it this way. But Hermaeus wrote the Shepherd very recently in our times in the city of Rome while Bishop Pius, his brother, was occupying the chair of the church of the city of Rome. And therefore, it ought indeed to be read, but it cannot be read publicly to the people in church, either among the prophets, whose number is complete, or among the apostles, for it is after their time. So it is not accepted into the canon because it comes too late and because Hermaeus is not an apostle. This book appears to be a compilation of materials from Paul's other letters. Paul mentions a letter to Laodicea, so someone probably slapped one together. Clement was not an apostle. He's one step removed. It is unlikely that first Clement was inspired because he refers to the mythical phoenix as an actual living creature. Second Clement was written much later, so it's not even from him. Clement died around 100 AD, much more dubious a writing than First Clement. And if we're not going to accept First Clement, no way we're going to accept Second Clement. Peter didn't write this. It comes way late. Peter is long since dead. Same thing. This is dated about 125 to 150 AD. Peter be dead. The, the historian Metzger puts the date here at about 150 AD. It was accepted only in Egypt. It has heretical doctrinal slant of Gnosticism. For this book, uh, we don't have it. We have little fragments, not much. So this book was never considered canonical, which is probably why it was not very widespread. Now, we're not really getting into the Old Testament here, but if we believe what the New Testament says about the person of Jesus, then the way that Jesus quotes the Old Testament and speaks about the Old Testament should give us all the confidence we need in those documents. And just as the writing of the scriptures were divinely inspired, so too the collection and canonization of those writings were divinely orchestrated. We may make mistakes in interpreting, scribes might make errors, but the divine origins of the Bible are so manifest that even human failures cannot diminish or degrade its message. Through thousands of years, these writings have conveyed the words of God and the inerrant truths that it proclaims have been faithfully transmitted by him for our understanding and his glory. So maybe, just maybe, Christians should read it. All right, so next week we're back to our regular scheduled programming. And again, as a reminder, next week will be the final week that ATC will appear on TCC's social media outlets. If you want to keep watching these videos, you need to subscribe to the Appropriate in the Culture YouTube channel. I know that some people have had trouble finding the channel. The easiest way to find it is to type Appropriate in the Culture in quotation marks in the search field on YouTube, and it should pop right up. You can also join my author's Facebook page or follow Appropriate in the Culture on Instagram. A follow gets you a follow. If you listen in podcast form, you can subscribe to Appropriate in the Culture on your favorite podcast app. If you don't subscribe or follow along with me on this journey, I will just stop making these videos. 
So subscribe, share, rate, and review. And I'll continue to see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Mm -hmm.